Hi, everyone. Thank you for watching the podcast today. I'm Dr. Maria Sampalis. Our guest today is Dr. Dory Carlson, and we are continuing the podcast of Amazing Women in Optometry. And for those of you that do not know Dory, she was the first female president of the American Optometric Association. Uh, she was president in 2011, and she during her time, she visited optometry schools, lobbied uh, extensively for her children's eye exams, essential uh, health um, for healthcare reform, and optometric management named her the most influential woman in optometry. And um, Primary Care News identified her as a pioneer in optometry. And in 2019, recipient of a, a Women in Optometry Thea Award for leadership. She was also the first female president for the North Dakota. Uh, optometry Association and honored her as a young optometrist in North Dakota as well as optometrist of the year. Um, she has has multi location practices in North Dakota with her husband for over 30 years and just continues to develop and expand. And in 2020, a uh, graduate of uh, University of Jamestown with master's in arts and leadership. So welcome Dory to the podcast. Thanks for asking me. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about your journey in optometry. I, th I think a lot of us, you know, want to know what you've done because um, you've paved the way for a lot of females in the industry. You know, it, it, I think what happens is you don't start out with a plan as far as where you're going to go, but it just kind of evolves. And that's what happened for me. We opened a practice in rural North Dakota, cold, and no pun intended on the weather. Um, but we started this practice and we really didn't know what we were doing. So we started, you know, we didn't know how to bill insurance. We didn't know how we were new out of school. And so we went to our state association and everybody was great about wanting to help us. We learned so much from other, other colleagues that taught us how to bill and code and, and, you know, just kind of baptism by fire. So I said, if you ever need help, let me know because you have helped us so much, you know, be careful of what you say, right? Because then that turns around. So before I knew it, um, they were asking me to serve on different um, committee structures for my state association. And that just kind of evolved into serving on the state association board. And, you know, one thing kind of goes after another. And I guess the big moral of my story is I just kept saying yes. I kept saying yes to things that scared me, things that maybe I didn't was truly out of my comfort zone. And if I had any piece of advice for somebody who wants to get into leadership positions or wants to develop those skills, just say yes. Um, so often we say no. Oh, I could never do that. Or I don't have that skill set. But I don't certainly didn't know what I was doing. But I said yes. And so that's so true. Kind of that's scary, so true. But it's like you learned a lot about yourself in the process. Yeah, that's, you know, that's so true over the years. I just, you know, just say yes to everything that comes your way. And same thing I've done. And I'm like, well, I got to figure this out. <laughs> but what? yeah, and then you just go, you're uncomfortable that you just get more comfortable with it. And there's so many people out there willing to help you and get comfortable. So yeah, absolutely. So and now we have two locations, you know, we've been we're currently gutted one of our locations, so we can't even see patients in it for the last three weeks. So, you know, we're still evolving and still expanding and, and still doing stuff. So um, it's still been fun. It's been a fun journey. Tell us about your journey as a female in the industry. Uh, you know, what obstacles have you overcome? You know, I talk to a lot of young females. Sometimes, unfortunately, there are some still some biases in the industry. There are some, you know, gaps in leadership and things like that. And um, how, how have you overcome that? And, and what is your advice for some young females if, if they want a leadership position? When I first started getting involved in the volunteer structure for AOA, even before I was in the AOA volunteer structure, when I was representing my state association, I remember going to a meeting in Baltimore. And it was for the RUC committee or it was coding or something to do with coding. And um, I re remember standing in the back of the room and there was a handful of women in the room and the women by and large were executive directors of the optometric associations. And there was maybe one other female OD that was there. And I just thought, wow, this is just a really different place because there's really not any women here. And so oftentimes people ask me who are my female mentors. I really didn't have any. Um, I, I didn't have any to 
everybody to follow in the footsteps. So, you know, and then I, for a while I thought, oh, I've never had any, um, you know, bias against me or anything because of gender or anything like that. But, you know, looking back, um, I was probably more naive. Yeah, I did. Um, you know, when you think about it now from a perspective here, and I guess I just didn't let it bother me. I, yes, I went home and, you know, vented or whatever, but it's like you, you can't wear that on your sleeve all the time. And so you just have to keep going and going through it. You'll come across it. And for a variety of reasons, there's going to be biases, um, but you just have to keep going. Yeah, keep going is is the point. You're right. You, you vent a little bit, but you just overcome and just keep going. Um, and you don't let it stop you from whatever your goal is. And I, I think that's a good point to to for our listeners, because a lot of people, the ODs that I talk to, they have an obstacle and they just stop and they don't keep going. But you just evolve as a person like even you, you're continuing to evolve you're in your 30th year plus practice, you're still changing your practice, you're uh, vamping it up, trying to make it look nice and staying up to time. So um, it's just kind of continuing to to grow and have that growth mindset, I think, as well. And that's like, you know, really. Yeah. What have you been like with over the years um, with like speaking opportunities? How have you evolved with that? And um, what kind of got you into a position to, to want to pursue to be the president of the American Optometric Association? Ah. Well, let's cover speaking first. Um, I w was terrified of public speaking. Uh, I can think back on some speeches that I gave a long time ago that I'm just totally embarrassed about because I did such a poor job. Um, but you kind of figure out what makes you comfortable and I've figured out over the years what style of speaking that I feel most comfortable with. And now I actually find it kind of fun, as long as I can do it in the style that I'm comfortable with. And, and that makes all the difference in the world, obviously being prepared and things. And um, But now I think speaking is kind of fun. Um, AOA. No, I, I represented my state association and then ended up in the volunteer structure. I said yes when I was asked and ended up in the volunteer structure. And then people started talking to me about the fact that I should run for the AOA board. And I'm like, you're crazy. Um, actually, my husband said that I should run for the AOA board. And I said, are you crazy? Do you have any idea what time commitment that is? And um, he said, well, I think you do a really good job. So, I mean, of course, I had his his support in doing something like that. But, you know, eventually somebody keeps talking to you and keeps talking to you and somebody, you know, mentors say, hey, I think you should do this. And if enough people start saying that and you start talking to other people, that's how I ended up running, deciding to run for the AOA board. And it's an elected position. Um, I had somebody from California running against me. It's based on votes for the number of ODs that are members in your state. And I remember North Dakota had 11 votes. You need over a thousand, I forget the exact number, closer to 1500 votes in order to be elected. So I certainly didn't get elected based upon my state. Yeah. Uh, now over the years, you've done a lot of great things and you know, balancing a practice, other things outside the practice, advocating for the profession. You had young kids at one point. How did you balance all these things for the young female ODs that, you know, are doing a lot, have a lot more on their plate and want to do more um, in the industry? I would love to tell you that there's a really wonderful way to balance everything. There isn't. Yeah. And some things were just really out of balance at times. You try to do the best that you can. But I think if you really are passionate about what you're doing, it makes it easier. If you're doing something that you don't like doing, that's a whole different story because I wouldn't want to do that as well. But if you're doing something that you're passionate about and that you really believe in, um, it, it you can make it do, you can make it happen somebody was asking me if they should run for an association board i thought they were talking about the american optometric association and so i'm doing this whole spiel about you know this is what you need to do this is how you do it and person had young kids 
and I'm all done with my, you know, talk kind of a convincing this young woman to to serve. And it turns out that she was talking about her state association board. And I just looked at her and I started laughing. I said, oh, that's a no brainer. I mean, that's easy. So just do it. I have young kids. I, you know, I, I think the biggest thing that I could say to your listeners is let your partner be a parent. I can't tell you how many times people have come up to me and said things like, well, he doesn't know how to you know, do X, Y, or Z, or he wouldn't do it this way or that way. And, and you just have to kind of allow your partner to be a parent as well if you have young kids. Because I hear still about them talking about the partner babysitting. Well, no, you're parenting. You're not babysitting. And I remember one of the times that when I first got on the AOA board, I felt really guilty. I had young kids. I had food in the fridge. I had all the clothes washed. I had the birthday presents for the birthday party that was going to happen in three days from now. I had all of the stuff that all laid out that everything was like, you know, because I had this mom guilt, right? My husband went on a, a bicycling trip for a week. And that was kind of my aha moment. There was no food in the fridge. There was no clothes that were laundered. There was no, and granted, he's a wonderful partner and a great help, right? But that wasn't his guilt thing. And it was on me that I did it. And after that, I kind of just stopped doing that stuff and thought, okay, you know, we're partners here. He can, he can do this just as well as I can. So that would be a piece of advice and kind of an aha moment for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, I, you're right. Because when I leave and I do some conference stuff, my refrigerator is full. It's, it's like, we cook our I have pre-made meal foods gonna put in the oven, laundry's done, everything's ready. And he's like, We're we're fine. We could just we could just go out for burgers, you know, like that. And the kids are fine and thing and they come fine. The house is not on fire when I come back. And you know, just more stress, I think. You for added me to, to add it to yourself, but you just know you just gotta sometimes just let them do it their way. They do it a different way, and that's fine as long as the kids are taken care of. Um Agreed. it's fine. It's just you know, and it's less stress on you and, you know, share the responsibilities, not just on you. I know a lot of us females kind of are the caregivers and we want to take care of everybody. And, but it's okay to do that. And it's okay. Um, you know, to we, let we him take care of ourselves, you know, more than it's not expected of us, but we bring that guilt to ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, years later, I was asked to give a talk, something, you know, I've done several of these and, Okay, well, what was it like for your kids? So I went to my boys. Now my boys are 26 and 23. But they were probably about 18, 19 when I went to them in that age group, late teens, early 20s. Okay, so I've been asked to do a talk. And so about, you know, women in optometry. And I want to know if you resented the fact of me not being around for, you know, the things that I missed. <laughs> my older son looks at me and he goes, what did you miss? <laughs> and I was like, really? Like I was gone a lot. And he's like, well, I didn't notice that you missed anything. Okay. And then around that same time frame, I got a Mother's Day card from the same son. And it was the most beautiful thing that he wrote in there, Maria, about what a wonderful mom that I was and that how proud he was of me being president. And, you know, that I was a hard act to follow because he was trying to live up to my shoes. And you know, I, I think I used to joke that I was trying to raise good husbands. I think I did that. I think they're good some husbands when they find the right person. That's great. And now they're, they're successful young adults and, and they're yeah. doing well. So, um, you know, I, I did this podcast with other successful females in the industry and their, their children are older and they see by example, most of the time you're that's hard worker. Good. They see that. Um, so that's good. Cause I worry about those things too. My kids are younger. And I, I worry about that. But doing these podcasts, I feel reassured that um, they're seeing by example, seeing what hard work is, seeing what's working together with your partner, um, what it's supposed to be like and the, and the and then what you do together. Right. Because it's ultimately for us, it's it's we work together for our family. And um, so I, they, I think it's what they see is how they grow as well. And I, I think just doing these podcasts, I think I say to you, how are your kids? Are they successful? They're all successful. They all went to college. They all did well. So. You know, that mom guilt that you're might not, you know, not around as much. It, they don't even realize it either. So it's what you what you think. Yeah. It's yeah. Um, yeah. When I decided to go back and get my master's, 
my oldest son was, well, actually both of them were in college. And so for a while, we had three of us from our household in college at the same time. And so I told my kids, you know, hey, I'm, I'm going to go back and get my master's in leadership. And my oldest son thought that was the coolest thing ever. And he's like, yeah, go for it, mom. You know, this will be great. And then my younger son, different personality. Why in the heck would anyone ever want to go back to school? <laughs> and it's like, no, this will be great. So but now it's kind of funny because now just recently I got a phone call from one of them that said that he was thinking about going back and getting his master's and he wanted to know what I had done. Like, well, that's pretty cool. So Yeah, of course. Yeah. You set the example and uh, you kind of motivate them and inspire them. And uh, what kind of what drives you to continue to do more and achieve more now being, you know, 30 plus years in practice? You know, I guess I view myself as a lifelong learner, that if you if you stop moving, if you stop growing, you know, then you look at all your patients that you see and you can kind of tell who still is vibrant and who still is is, you know, happy with life. I used to joke that when I was in the VA, when I did my residency in the VA, you know, mo mostly it was men between the ages of 40 and 80. And I started paying attention. There were some people that were 80 that felt like they were 60. And there were some folks that were 60 that felt like they were 80. You know, and I was like, well, what's the difference? Smoking was a big one as far as what you look like and age wise. But then it was usually about still being interested in life that I found that the people that were older but still were really interested in people and life and learning just seemed younger. So, you know, I kind of used that as an inspiration of mine, I guess. And I just kind of keep doing what I'm doing. And what has been the new interest like over the years getting, um, you know, a master's in leadership and, you know, you, you speak on leadership in the industry. Uh, I think you're speaking at Expo. Uh, you have a column in OM. Congratulations on that. Um, and, you know, tell us about that. And, and why do you think leadership is so important for, you know, optometrists, even if they don't have a position just for, for their own practice, let's say. So where that came about was when I got off the AOA board, my whole point about saying yes, when I got off the AOA board, I was afraid nobody would ever ask me to do anything ever again. All right. I'm too young to just go and, you know, not do anything with organized optometry ever again. That was my concern. So people asked me to serve on different advisory boards. Um, you know, I actually did some lectures on um, glaucoma. You know, I, I did some different things because I was blessed with lots of contacts. And so people would ask me to do things. So I said yes to everything because I was afraid that nobody would ever ask me to do anything ever again. And in that process, of course, I did everything that I said I was going to do. But I started paying attention to the things that when I was done, what jazzed me up the most? Like what was the most like when you're done, you're just like, that was fun. Right. And it usually was something that I learned when I went around to every school in a college of optometry is I gave like a, a motivational talk to all the students about why they should be involved in our profession, why it's important, why we need to take care of our profession. Nobody else will take care of it. So, you know, my message was leave optometry better than the way you found it. And that was my core message for all of my students. And I just had a blast doing that. So as I was paying attention to what I was doing after being off the board, it all related to doing motivational things, being somewhat inspirational, teaching people how to be lifelong learners, growth. And so it just kind of had this natural fit that um, I ended up doing more talks about those things that I really liked doing. And I started saying no to a few things that I didn't enjoy as much. So I learned. And then that's where the, the masters came about was, I have the same degree as you. So I'm standing up in front of you and talking about leadership. Yes, I may have been AOA president, so I have a little bit of difference experience that way, but I didn't feel in my own self qualified enough to know enough about the leadership topic. And that's why I went and got my master's because now I have a better understanding of the different types of leadership and a, a more breadth and knowledge of it that I felt I could speak more clearly about that topic. Yeah. And, and leadership is about creating more leaders, right? So you're going around teaching optometrists to be leaders in the industry, whether it's advocating for the profession, maybe it's for their practice. I mean, I've, I've written articles saying, hey, even moms are leaders, right? I mean, they're born like you're 
driving the house, right? You you could bring that to the practice too. And even if you're an employed optometrist, you're the leader in that in that setting there, right? Absolutely. So my yeah. very first paper that I had to write for my master's was what is leadership? 21 pages later, you know, I came to the conclusion that leadership is influence. So in, and in that definition, everybody has the ability to be a leader. So moms influence kids, teachers influence kids, doctors influence patients, um, you know, if friends influence other friends. So if, if you have influence or if you're influencing people, you have that leadership capability already. It's just what you do with it. Do you nurture it? Do you grow it? It's not going to grow all by itself. You have to do things that will nurture that leadership. But by that very definition, we all have the potential to be leaders. It just depends upon if we grow it or not. Yeah. I, you know, and I think that's a great thing of what you said, because some people think that leadership is a title and some people have titles and they're not real leaders, you know, and, and people don't only follow them because they have to, it's their boss. And there's others in the industry, people follow and, 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 and help advocate for and, and work with and, 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 and their influence because they're doing it for the greater good. Like, like your quote said, what do you, you whatever you're doing for optometry today, making it better in the future, right? Which making it better than what you started with. Um, what do you think leadership is like, do you think leaders are born or do you think leaders are made? Well, that's what I was just talking about. Is that you're, you're, we all have the potential to be leaders. It just depends upon if we're growing our skills or not and what you do to grow those skills. And how do you grow your skills, books, videos? With the internet nowadays, you can do anything, right? You could do master's classes. You could do, um, you know, I like watching motivational talks from leaders. I'm a big fan of John Maxwell. In fact, yeah. I went to one of his events, um, it, which in Florida, which is a great event. Uh, there's just so many, even as little as making a point to get together at a meeting with somebody that you respect or view as a leader and have coffee with them. You can just learn so much just by visiting with other people. And so it doesn't have to be anything formal. It's just who you associate with and who you follow. That's true. Yeah. You know, I've learned a lot over, over the last year when I started the podcast, just talking to people like yourself, I've learned so much. And I was like, I'm going to ask them questions. I want to see what they're doing with things that I'm experiencing because um, they've gone through it. And, you know, I've learned so much, but even so from personal development standpoint, you're right. There's a lot of information out there and you can get maybe like, oh, five minutes a day of quick down and dirty from Instagram, YouTube, whatever you follow certain people and, and you get information you got to, and each day you got to get a little better, right. Um, for whatever your goal is. And there's so much information out there and there's so much good out information and, you know, some people don't utilize that and, and you know, kind of look at social media for, you know, just entertainment purposes. Um, so there are there is so much and way to grow um, just getting information from YouTube or, or Instagram or whatever. I mean, it's it's amazing because you just got to have the motivation to continue to want to grow and whatever the purpose is. Absolutely. I agree more. Yeah. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Carlson, for coming on the podcast today. You are truly one of the amazing women in optometry. And uh, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for asking me. Yeah.